Welcome, Sharon Catherine Brown. It is a joy to have you on the podcast. It is a joy to be here, my dear, dear friend who I love so much. Well, and and it's hard for me to say that full name because I just know you as Shay Cat. That's that's you can, your name. And, yeah, I mean, I'm fine with you. L- look, that you'll do your thing and let people know who's on your show. But do you, do you have to call? We're friends, people. We're friends right, in right. real exactly. life. So, yeah, don't, now, now, don't when do was that, the... Sharon Catherine, on me. <laughs> <laughs> now, when was the first time you used Shay Cat? When did you start going by that name? A friend of mine, Brian Flores, uh, was in the show Head Over Heels with me uh, on Broadway. And he he gave me that name and it stuck. And everybody was like, that's so cool. And I was like, it was it was done with such affection and I loved it so much. And then it just went and then everybody, everybody calls me Shay Cat. And I I love it so much because of how it was started in it's just gone from project to project. And I'm like, yeah, that's just, it makes me so happy. I always think of Brian when somebody calls me Shay Cat and, and everybody calls me Shay Cat. Yeah. Yeah. Because it wasn't until like the, I think the second week of our rehearsals in Anna Green Gables that I knew your name was Sharon. Like people would say, <laughs> people would say Sharon. I was like, who's Sharon? They go, Shay Cat. I went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it also came really came in handy when uh, when I did Caroline or Change because I was the standby for Sharon D. Clark. Mm. I was Sharon C. Brown, and Sharon, I was like, that has never happened ever, ever. And I, and I was like, you don't have to worry about who's who you're calling because I go by Shay Cat, so. And everybody was like, oh, that's great. You know, and it was on all my clothes and everything. It was. Did you put stickers on everything? I saved that for you. I didn't get those stickers until we did Anne of Green Gables. (laughs) So what you need to know, listener, is that (laughs) this woman bought stickers that that just had Shay Cat all over them. And then she, then she proceeded to put these stickers everywhere in her dressing room on donut boxes everywhere they were i don't know what you're talking about donut boxes (laughs) um i don't understand like what you're talking about actually and dressing room mirrors i mean i understand that you have an audience that you have to appeal to but don't lie don't like (laughs) me Do it honest, you know? Get, You're right. You're get right. the ratings honestly. Don't tell stories like that. That's ridiculous. Who would do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, then fine. Why don't, why don't we tell some of your stories now? That, yeah. That'll get us into the first one. And so you want to talk about being not just a Broadway legacy baby, meaning that one of your parents is, yeah. you know, was on Broadway, but you're a double Broadway legacy baby. What, how? <laughs> so, okay, so yeah. You come from so a long line how- then. Yeah, here's how it works. So, uh, so um, you know, uh, m- my dad, Johnny Brown, who is from Laffin and Good Times, he was Mr. Bookman on Good Times. He passed away recently. And so you you know that because you're my friend and you went through um, so much w- with me with that. And my dad was uh, Sammy Davis Jr.'s protege. And they he was one of the stars of Sammy's show Golden Boy. On, on, and he had a huge number uh, uh, called uh, Don't Forget 127th Street. It literally brought down the house eight shows a week. Like that was my dad's big break. But he was also on Broadway in a show called, in a play, that was a musical, in a play called Carry Me Back to Morningside Heights, directed by Sidney Portier. Yeah. And um, Louis Gossett Jr. was in that. And uh, uh, what is Laura Dern's mother's name? Di- uh, Diane. Uh, 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 Diane Ladd. Uh, Diane Ladd. And uh, David. Uh, David Klein. And oh, who is it? Like so, like an incredible cast. Where you look and go, are you kidding me? And um, and my mother was in here's where it gets so that it's rare if you're a, a broadway legacy baby that's you know pretty cool and rare you're not going to meet a whole lot of double broadway where both parents have done and you're probably maybe definitely not going to meet someone 
whose parent did a Broadway show with their parent. So my mother was in a Broadway show, Memphis Bound, with her mother, my grandmother, Mimi. That's crazy. I mean, I, I tell that story all the time because it's it makes me so proud and it makes me so, so happy. And um, it's it like truly I came out of the womb, you know, looking for center and knowing where I mean, it's, did, did it feel it, like destiny? You were born to do theater? It felt like that to me. But my parents, my parents were ahead of their time in terms of this. They felt this is what they do for a living. That nothing in them wanted to push their kids to do it. So if it weren't for friends of my parents, maybe I wouldn't have gotten into show business as early as I did because it's my friends that were like, can't you see what you have? Like she's because I, I started at three and a half with like baby modeling. Cause somebody put my picture in a friend of my parents, put my picture in and you know, all this stuff started happening because my, my parents were like, we don't want to be those parents. And when I was doing commercials and print work, we, I really did see a lot of creepy things. Uh, I mean, I, I remember this, this sticks out in my, in my head the most, I think it was, um, a pudding commercial. It may have been jello pudding. And, uh, the casting person came out. We're all like, I don't know, six, you know, we're babies. All the casting person asked who likes chocolate, raise your hand, who likes vanilla, raise your hand. Just so that when we went in, they wouldn't be giving us something that we didn't like. It was not like, if you like vanilla, you weren't going to get the job. It wasn't that it was just for let's, you know, make sure they get, and I saw a mother go, I think her, her daughter raised her hand. She was like, put your hand down because she thought more people are raising their hands for chocolate. You raise your hand for vanilla. You know, like I saw mm. stage mothers like that. And my, my mom was never that. And so on many gigs as a child, my mother was the only parent that was allowed either on set or in the theater and then because she was normal. <laughs> well, I mean, coming from a theater background herself, then she knew the business and she knew not to take this personally or kind of how to manage this or that way. He was not only a, a performer, but she was, was an acting teacher. I mean, that I, lo I love my, my mom's point of view as well as my dad's, but I, my mom, I ha had to be with uh, a parent or a guardian. So it was always my mom, like on set or in it. And she would always look at someone and go, she doesn't pay the bills here. We don't, we're not living off of our daughter. She doesn't have to be in this business. So if things were not correct, meaning there was a cot uh, for, you know, we have, when you're underage, you have certain laws and rules that have to be mm -hmm. adhered to. And if things were not right, she was like, I'm pulling her. It wasn't like a diva thing. It was like, she's a child and she's a child first and this is so they were like this is not a woman trying to live vicariously through her daughter she's just she's a mom first and she you know we I had to be professional so I was not a bratty kid because that was not gonna fly with my mother and father you know what I mean so I'm I'm fortunate in that respect that my parents were my parents first. My parents were never like, I, I give a lot of people in show business that have made mistakes that were child actors. I give them a pass because I see the way they were raised. And I see in almost, no, in really in every single case, the parents got so involved in, in show business that they weren't parenting. And I, and I really, I give them a pass for a lot of stuff because this is a hard industry to be in if you're parenting yourself. And it's really, you're always one breath away from being a, 
the true Hollywood story if you don't have parents that are like, um, I don't care whether you're starring on television or on Broadway, your room needs to be cleaned. That's important. Well, yeah, it's that it's that that sense of being grounded so that you don't get, you know, because how you're treated on set is not how you're treated at home or in the rest of your life. And you need to recognize that and know yeah. that difference. Yeah. Oh, when I did my first movie, I, because I'm, I'm, my foundation is theater and I'm just so grateful for that. And I love theater so much. Like I just love theater so much. Uh, it's in, in, an incredible medium to me. And when I did my first movie, and I remember this, like it was yesterday, um, I walked through the doors of the theater because it it was a chorus line. And so we were, were we shooting at the Mark Hellinger, the old Mark Hellinger, walking through the stage door and to myself, but like at this level, I was like, I wonder, I wonder if I want breakfast, but just like no louder than that. I'm like two production assistants they were like raptors, you know, in Jurassic Park, they, were, they come from either side. It was like that. And they were like, can I get, can I get you anything? You want a muffin or you want a bagel? And I thought in that moment, I was like, oh, this is why people lose their minds. I got it. I understood. I was like, if this is all you know, then you, there's no way you can be grounded. If you could whisper, a, 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 if you're just wondering about something, and somebody is, <laughs> you know what I mean? In theater, it's like, you better get your, look, if one of your castmates doesn't bring breakfast, sometimes you don't have it. It's like, right, if there's no donuts. I mean? <laughs> there's no donuts, and there's no bagels, <laughs> you may be going hungry until lunchtime. And I love that about us, by the way. But, you know, it, I, it's like I got a really big life lesson in one moment of time to go, there are some people that they graduated college and hit it big. And all they know is this, yeah. they don't know anything else. And so they don't, they don't know, like, for instance, um, I, I played Dorothy and the Wiz on tour and Andre de Shields was my Wiz. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I know. How wonderful. Right? Wow. I know. And everyone was really intimidated by him because of his presence and also he worked that he like he knew people were intimidated so he worked it but <laughs> ding dong you know shay cat was too young because I, I was the youngest to ever play the role i was 13 and to me it was oz on stage and off and i i was just in i loved him so much and they like i would knock on his door and people would look look and they would they would go stiff like oh my god you're not supposed to knock on his door and I was like he loved me you know what I mean like I, he just loved me so I got away with anything and um but my I was getting I was making a quick change and getting dressed because because when I first in, uh, started the show I was a munchkin I mean literally I was a munchkin at 13 I was a munchkin <laughs> off stage <laughs> I was literally a munchkin and I, I was came into my dressing room my mom is there because i'm underage my mom is there uh threw my costume down and my mom like looked at me and she glared and she said what are you doing and i was like what i said you know because i'm trying to be sophisticated i was like i'm making a quick change and she's like your change isn't that quick she said hang up your costume those are your clothes pick up your <laughs> if you don't have like I'm so fortunate because if you don't know, you don't, then you only learn what your experience is. You know, you know what I'm saying? And if you're parenting yourself, there, there are some 13 year olds that hit it big on, on a television show and their parents are not in show business and may not necessarily be guiding them in that way. And so they become the breadwinner and there, do you know what I mean? Then the, the role switch or the dynamic switches is what mm -hmm. I mean between right. parent and child. And suddenly they're just anything I want, anything. I, and that, that would never fly in my household. Oh my goodness. I mean, if, if, and I never did that again. That's the thing is I never did that again. I've had 
uh, wardrobe people and wardrobe assistants look at me and go, wow, you're so, you're so needy. You're so considerate. Don't worry. I've got it. And I'm like, no, I've got it. Unless this is a thing of this is a quick change. No, I'm hanging up those in my clothes. Cause the, the other thing, my mother was like, have pride. It. That's your character. Those are your clothes. This is your costume. This is the, the integrity of, of the business is what I was taught by both of my parents. And I'm really, I, I am always so grateful for that because I, I, you could be a monster <laughs> if you start as early as I did and you have no guidance. <laughs> you're good. But at the same time, it sounds like that, yes, your, your parents taught you a certain way and, and having respect and integrity, but at the same time, you still got to be a kid and enjoy it. It was still a playground and fun for you. Yes, absolutely. Yes, because that was, that was the reason that my mom was always willing to pull me off set because she's like, if it can't, you, she knew and my dad knew that I was professional and that I knew what that meant and my, and that I learned it's show business. It's two words. And, and they knew that, but if they felt there was any kind of abuse that was getting ready to happen, they were like, we, no, she doesn't, she doesn't need it bad enough to have someone, uh, you know, to have a Judy Garland thing, give her amphetamines, to give it, she, you know what Oof. I'm saying? But at the same time, based upon your own parents and then you growing up in the theater, yeah. and now you are a mom yourself, did that yeah. affect how you mothered and how you raised your own son? Yes, because I had, yes, it, because it caused me to, put the brakes on my son is an incredible actor who has no interest in being an actor. And I mean, he did some really wonderful things. Uh, he's 18 now. He, and when he was younger, he did some really, in, 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 you know, wonderful performances. And I discovered that he could act when he was uh, nine or 10, maybe 10, the nine or 10. And I said, do you mind? Cause I had an audition coming up uh, back, back in the days before soap tapes. Mm -hmm. um, it was, and I said, do you mind reading with mommy and just practicing with me? So I've got the copy for him and the copy for me and we're doing the scene. And I'm like, can we, can we do it a couple of times for me? Obviously, I want to. I'm, I'm trying to get off book, off sides. And the second time, he's doing the scene, but he's not looking at the sides. But I'm looking at the sides, right? And I'm like, oh my god, oh my god. So I'm trying to stay in character and not go, oh my god, my my child is doing a cold read. My child is doing something that adults like melt. Be, before they're able to do it they like they find so intimidating and then the third time that we ran it i was in a scene with a really good young actor and i was like o m g now the reason why this is an omg moment for me is because i adopted my child so but and there are lots of people that don't know that because he has my smile and um and so people just assume they're like, well, of course, of course, you know, he's taking, I was like, no, no, not necessarily. Of course. You know what I mean? It's a, but he has absolutely, and I don't know whether it'll change, but I felt myself, I had to check myself because I was given a little push. I was, I felt not I felt, come on, Sharon, you can be honest. I was giving a little pushback on what he actually wants to do, you know, when he was like, I'm not, I'm not interested in that. I couldn't accept the fact that it was a hobby mm. and that he was like, that was then. And now I'm because, because he was so good because the stillness that actors take many, many classes in years of classes to get, he had it naturally, that stillness. And there's just, and, and so I was like, you got, you cannot have your great parents and then you be Mama Rose. You, you, this cannot happen. So, 
and because I never got to that yes yet, but I would be like, <laughs> "Your school's having an audition for that. <laughs> you, you were killing that role." Like, I, and I, I put the brakes on that because because I I did. You know, it, it's not it's not fair for me to do that. Um, yeah, he's he's going to be his own person, wh wh whether or not you right. push him, really. That's right, and that's why you know I. I stopped. But there's nothing that my parents could have done. It would. It was either going to be a three and a half or whenever I could, you know, communicated to them. You must. You must support this. I'm good. It was going to be that for me. That was, you know, and you know, if he chooses it later on, that's incredible. And and if he wants to be a lawyer or a doctor, I'll scream my lungs out and go, oh my God, no, not steady work. You know, but <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Well, for your second story, and I found this one to be hysterical. For your second story, you wanted to share when you knew that you were a drama queen. <laughs> yes. Okay. So the, <laughs> this is when I this is when I knew. So a little backstory: my first my broad my Broadway debut was Maggie Flynn with Shirley Jones and Jack Cassidy. And in that cast uh, was Irene Cara, who has just passed away. I've known her all my life. And Stephanie Mills and um, Giancarlo Esposito is an incredible actor. And uh, we, we went to the same school, but we were in different grades. They were all ahead of me. I was the baby of, the, of all those babies, you, you know, the baby of the baby group. And uh, we went to Lincoln Square Academy, which is a school, which was a school, it's no longer a school, for performing kids. The difference between that school and PA is PA, you really, you had to go to that school, but you couldn't also perform. Lincoln Square Academy is like, you could be, you could be on Broadway and go to school and, you know, that, you could do them both. So... We're these, we are, there's nine kids all, all together. And, you know, adults don't want to work with kids or animals, except for me. I'm that different adult that I'm like, put me on a Disney channel and surround me, please surround me with all the animals you got and all the kids you got. That's my dream job. Okay. That's my dream role, whatever that is. But we were aware that the adults were like, these kids are kicking our butt <laughs> like because you you're dealing with natural talent you're literally kids and you know that kids can do no wrong the adults are going to and but we were like this was a super talented group of kids with huge voices huge big like we like we were little adults and there was this big set uh, and it was a staircase, but huge, huge staircase, big staircase. And, you know, it moved. Um, uh, what, well, what's the word? It, it, like it, it, it wasn't it wasn't um, stage hands weren't moving it. It, it was, was on a track. It, thank you. I mean, I was like, what? How do I put this? It was like. Eeh. Right. And, and there was an elevator that a lift that came through for another part of, of, of this musical, uh, that, but I think it was for another scene. There was like a lift thing in the, in the, that came out of the floor. So we're all hams. Every one of us is a leg of ham. Okay. Just, just, but one night the stairs, I and mean, obviously this is during a performance, started to crumble. And whatever the mechanism was that moved it from, from underneath the stage, it just started to crash while we were on it. It starts, something happened and you know, eight shows a week, comes out eight shows a week and then there's that one time, right? Or it comes out and, and it started to, you, you heard it, you heard things going crap, but, this staircase went all the way up and there was like a kid on each stair. And so we were high up and it started to crumble and you heard the audience start to scream. 
because they were aware of the fact that, oh, this, this is not a part of the, the show. And the kids started to scream. And, the, and the, you know, everybody was screaming. And, the, and they, uh, the curtain had to come down. The stage uh, managers and a lot of the adult cast, they ran. And, you know, get, get, we were crying and screaming and just, you know, it's just it's like all of that. And they had to remove this huge set off. You know, the curtain came down. So there, however long that took to get that all done, and kids just, <gasps> I felt it change. Now, what I was four and a half or five, five, I think. I felt it change from we're in real danger, we're going to die, to this is the greatest performance of our lives. I felt it. <laughs> because it was an energy that passed from one child to another, all at this, but all at the same time. It was like a lightning bolt that hit us all. It was like, this is scary. And we're all gonna die. And this this staircase, this wooden staircase is crumbling. And we're having to jump into the arms of stage managers and other cast. And suddenly it was like, this is the this is the greatest moment of our lives. We were backstage. They were surrounding us, all of the, and my mother was nearby and had a feeling. She just had this feeling. She, she was with our teacher and she looked at, do I remember our teacher, Mrs. Crum? Am I right about that? She was lovely. And she said, I gotta go, I gotta go to the theater. I gotta go to the theater, something's up. My mom's always been that way. And when she came into the theater is when it was crumbling. She felt something was wrong. And one of the cast members that was also a friend of ours, he was like, he put his arms up and he said, he looked at my mother because my mother was like, I'm, I am flying onto the stage. She was running down the aisle going, all bets are off. I'm coming up. I'm getting my child. I jumped into his arms so that I could get off and say, he was like, I got you, I got you. We were backstage and in the time it took to get the set off and the curtain, the, the set, the stage was bare. And they were like, do you think you can sing? Cause our big number was coming up. All the kids sang this big song. It was a, like an eerie ballad. And they were like, do you think you could do this? And we were like, yes. And it was just very, it was getting more and more dramatic. Yes, 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 the show must go on. Patrick, let me just tell you, when that curtain came up, the ovation that the nine <laughs> kids got, that was the beginning of the end. That was, they created nine monsters, nine little monsters that it was like, there's nothing better on the face of this universe than what is happening to us right now. And life has to be like this. It can never not be, I can never not be on stage. And we all felt it. That was the moment I knew that I, I was a drama queen because I was like, that fear turned into all on its own, use this we can, this is the greatest moment. <laughs> By the way, the danger was real. That's the funny thing is that, oh, I'm right. Something really could have happened to you. No, no, it was crumbling. Like that's the thing. And, and if I can see it in my mind, but I'm, I'm sure that for the purpose of, of this audience, I'm not describing it adequately enough for you to see just how dangerous it was because the way it was crumbling, if we fell, not only, were we going to either get hurt or, or break bones, but we also could have fallen through the floor because there was an opening. That was what the problem was, is that there was a staircase, but there was an opening around it. So we also could have literally like, you know, wow. that could have been the end of us. And so it was like that, it was very real danger. And then, and then we were um, in the paper the next day. Oh, why, why would you put nine hams 
in the paper and with this giant root beer float that they got for us because we're alive. Our lives were spared and the show must go on. It was the, it was the best thing. And all the adults just had to get all the adults that, that night, they were, they were, they were atmosphere because we came back, we were children and we came back on that stage on a bare stage with nothing and sang our song and brought the house down. It was incredible. And then I was like, this feeling is the feeling I want to have for the rest of my life. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, that's such a dramatic moment. I mean, yes, dangerous, but also dramatic. And then as you say, once that ovation starts, you Come never, on. never want to get rid of that. Ever. You saved the sh You came back there. Look, the whole audience is looking at you guys, you little brave children, you brave little brown kids. Cause we're all brown. You brave little brown children, you, you are, we are good. You could, if you just move your pinky, we're here for it. And we're going to get, come on. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you're like, and I was like, well, what can happen now on stage that you're not just going to use that and go. And that is the other thing it being that it's live. Uh, it was the best, it was the best thing to happen because you could get through anything. You know, that's why that's why we do theater. You're, we're a particular breed of crazy because anything could happen when you're on stage mm -hmm. and you just have to go with it. You just have to go. I, I was uh, I was cast as Lucy in the touring company of Jekyll and Hyde. And a, there's a lot of moving parts to that set. And again, eight shows a week. So what could go wrong? You know, like stuff is going to, you can't have things that are moving electronically and not know that you're in for a ride at some point. Never in a show. Never in a show. Come on. I mean, Anne of Green Gables that we did. Remember? Please. <laughs> Wait a minute. That was, that was when the planks were just, I was like, oh, right. the, the, just it's a turntable. It's a turntable yes. of planks and they're supposed to turn a certain way at a certain time. And stop at a certain time and stop at a certain time <laughs> and of course I, I mean from the from tech rehearsal i looked at that the the girl running automation and i said this is nothing on you but that is going to break at some point it just you is certainly did i remember and i was like of course it is of course and they're like well well we're i was like no it's not about you it's gonna happen you're just because... asking for it yeah <laughs> yeah and you know it's gonna happen that's the thing is you're like and you know that you will deal with it. Because what you did you do in Jekyll and Hyde? How did you deal with it? There was a, a set that the scene switches from outside to uh, Dr. Jekyll's office. And Lucy is on a, is sitting in the, in the office, but that part of it slides in. It's, and it's, uh, it's, you know, again, it's all electrical and it's like, it slides in. And so it's, it slid in and creates the office, right? It's the, it's the segue, but then it slid right back out. And I was like, well, there you go. I was supposed to start <laughs> talking to him and then it's, it, it stopped and slid back in. And we were starting the dialogue and my chair just started to turn, <laughs> just started. I was like, well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. But I but mean, but at the same time, that is also what is so magical about theater. Just that anything can happen, whether it's whether it's a line or something happens with another character or the chair beneath you just starts yes. to move. I love seeing that's a, and and you know the audience loves that too because they get to say, "Oh, I was there the night." You know, you love that. Like I saw Mean Girls. The night that uh, the lady playing the lead, her wig fell off and it was just her wig cap. And Ashley Park was trying to hold it on. And they were, of course, you're hysterically laughing. She was trying to hold the mic on because it was she was just left in her stocking cap and mic on top of her head. Because it was supposed to be a, a quick illusion thing where suddenly she's in a, another top or something that wig came off but they couldn't go on because they had to reset it it was important to me so they had to bring the curtain down i it, it, ashley uh came back backstage when did i see her i guess 
oh, I guess she saw Head Over Heels. And I got to tell her that. I said, I was there the night. <laughs> I was there the night that the curtain came down because of that. it was one of the funniest things. They could do no wrong. The audience, first of all, we're all fans of the movie. We're, 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 the whole audience is there to, because we love it. We were screaming, laughing. And when the curtain came back up, they practically got a standing ovation because that's what the, that's what it is. You know, it's a, it's in that, in that moment, it's not about the fourth wall because we're all just in, involved in whatever that moment is. And it was great. You know, I've had, well, I've had a bunch of those moments. Well, when it comes to, to theater, obviously the highs are wonderful and that's why we keep doing it, but it's going to have its little low points, disappointments. I, I know for me, like one of mine was back in middle school when another boy was cast in the high school's production of The Sound of Music. I didn't get to do it. He got to do it. It's very devastated. Um, but, but have you had similar experiences like that where, you know, where you had your heartbreak as well? Oh, yeah. I mean, yes. Yeah, because when you audition for something and you really want it and you feel that you have you know, fired on all cylinders and you don't get it, you know, I, I, I think I went through a period of time where you were made to feel like you, you, you look, just shake it off, just shake it off and you go on to the next and you're, you know, you hear people say all the time, your job is auditioning. I get that. And you guess it, but auditioning, you know, unfortunately like a job does not pay your bills, you know? And it, so, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not so, uh, into the hiding of my disappointment anymore because I don't, I feel like, Sometimes we're asked to hide our feelings or change the way we feel or feel bad for feeling bad. I think, I mean, I think as you get older, you look and go, what do people keep telling us that no longer serves me? Sometimes I'm just really disappointed and it's, it's okay to be that. And then sometimes I will not get something and I can you know, shake it off and go sometimes, it, it, but it depends on how much I really want it. It depends on if I am thinking, gosh, I know I can, can do this. And it's, it's okay to, to live in that for, for a bit. I think when we start denying our feelings, it, it doesn't make sense. We're actors. We're, we're a bundle of feelings and we're supposed to expose them. So well, you and, know, and I, especially for you, starting out as a child, yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's one of the, why some adults don't want to be with children, because it can be so unpredictable. It can be just this bundle of emotions. It can be, you know, uh, unprofessional, quote unquote, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. you, you don't know what you're going to get with the kid. And it's, you know, it's like, oh, okay, who knows? But then, but then mm -hmm. some children, I've worked with some children that are just a delight to be yeah. with, both on stage and off. So it, yeah. it, it, you, you never know what you're going to get with that. Oh, the, ki the, ki the, the kids in Caroline are change. Oh my gosh. I, I love them so much. They're so talented. It's ridiculous. And, and also they're, they're real show business kids. There was a, um, a trend, you know, we go through trends in, in the industry of using real kids. We want real kids you know what, give me a show business kid over a real kid any day, because I need somebody who knows, number one, that this is make believe. No, I, I want them to hit their mark. I want them to cry on cue. I want them to be, be that show business kid is they're invaluable. And every one of those kids in Carolina change was a show business kid. It, realism, we can get, let them go to a reality show. And if you want, if you want those kids, let, but for theater and the movie, I, I love a kid that knows that this is a business and knows what they're doing. Um, there's a, a very, like very rough scene between Caroline and Noah, the little boy and Caroline are change. And some things are said uh, from Caroline that I found really 
difficult to, to say just as a human being to another human being. And when, um, when we were in rehearsal, the first time that I had to say that to with one of the Noahs, you know, we did, did the scene and we're in it and came off stage and I just, I bawled my eyes out mm. because it was so difficult for me to say something that cruel to a child because you know how much I love children. You got like, if you're around me for like three seconds, you know, I love children and animals so much. And the, my castmates were like, I know, I know. He's like, he's okay. He's okay. And he came to me, he came to me like an old man. He was like, we're good. We're good. And he, you know, he oh. <laughs> but he was like this grown man. I was like, I, I said, I love you. And from, from that time on when, whenever, uh, cause I, I went on several times and from that time on, before we would always start, we would look at each other, no matter who I was going on with it. We love each other. This is just make believe nothing we say matters. Nothing we say is true. We love each other. And, uh, when, when we were closing, uh, Jaden, who I went on with a, a lot, my Noah and, um, he made a cookie and, and he made cookies for everybody with sayings on him and he put on mine and I still have it. I have it in the freezer. I was like, there's no way I can eat this. Like, he said, we love each other. Remember that always we love each other. And this is all just make believe and nothing. And I was like crying, looking at my cookie going, how sweet are you? These kids give me show business kids any day of the week, any day of the week. That's, yeah. so, that's so wonderful. You know, yeah. it's it, it's interesting you talk about being able to say harsh things on stage, you know, especially because it's, it's one thing when you do it on camera because you get, you know, one, two, three, four, maybe five takes, you know, depending on what it is, different angles, but, but then it's done. But theater, there's something about it. It's that eight times a week. It's that week after Ooh. week, sometimes months ongoing where you're in in these rough scenes like that. Yeah. And certainly with a child, you know, you, you, you want to know. It's harder you want, you with want, a child. Yeah. You yeah. want that child to know it's make believe, but even with adults and, and I, it's interesting that you brought that up. Cause I, I've been reading about, um, you know, just as we've gone through the last couple of years and a little more racial awakening and uh, just trying to navigate that. And now mm -hmm. certain plays are being produced that have mm -hmm. tough elements in it and yeah. presenting things like that between people of different racial, different mm -hmm. classes. different, And so have you found that same type of connection, even with adults or, or kids, when, when you're having to present tough material that has a historical reference to it as well like that? I haven't really had that experience with yet, you know, just because of the roles, the nature of the roles. I haven't really had that um and i wonder how how that will how that will be you know depending on what the what the material is i mean i am careful about the roles that i choose when it's theater or musical theater either you know straight play or musical theater because of the, you when you're doing eight shows a week you know that it's pretend but your cells don't know you know what i mean they're your your body doesn't know that that's that's why taking care of your yourself both physically emotionally and financially is important you know that it's important that that actors get to make a living too i'm just gonna say that <laughs> it's you know it, it's it's important because that it's it's a it's a it's a difficult thing to do but because we love what we do it is diminished by so many people and you know i find that i find that a lot you, know, you love what you do. i've had people say that to me no, no matter how hard the, the schedule is, I've had people say, but you're doing what you love. Yes, I am doing what yeah. I love. But but that doesn't mean... <laughs> it doesn't mean it took a lot of work to get there. No, 
Nobody, nobody ever says that to a producer or a director or a casting director. I know nobody says those things, but you're doing what you love. They're like, yes, that, it is hard. <laughs> With actors, they're like, put on your clown collar and get out there and make us laugh you know because they say that with uh, olympic athletes like like oh my gosh the, the the trading and struggles that they went through it's like but they're doing what they love i mean they love those sports whatever events yeah. they're in yes. and so it, yeah that's the same thing but that but we recognize it's interesting we recognize the hard work that someone who does a, a marathon or someone who does a high jump or all these different gymnastic events but yet someone gets on stage and sings their guts out and they're smiling and they hit that high note and it's like wow they're just doing what they love it, it's it's almost like we don't see the hard work that goes into it and i can i can point to you when we did anne of green gables your big 11 o'clock number as marilla after matthew dies like it, it was interesting some of the vocal choices that you make i was like how is she going to do this eight times a week and yet every show you were there your voice was there and i know that it was it was preparation on your part it like the things that you would do vocally certainly i know on stage and hopefully an audience gathered yeah. that that it was something that took training and precision and exactitude to get night after night because doing it once for a recording fine you you, you could do probably even more than you did but to do what you did takes training it takes hard work and you love it but it, it it does, as you say, it doesn't diminish the craft yeah. and work that goes into it. And we also, when you're doing eight shows a week, you you live a certain way if you're going to do eight shows a week at 100%. And I'm not saying that to, I know there's this big, there's some big controversy going on. And I don't know enough about it, but there's somebody said 75% or that. I know it exists. I just don't know enough about it to talk on it. So I'm just, just saying I was always taught, you know, you give a hundred percent and, and that's, that's valuable. You know, um, I think sometimes when you're talking about, um, when you were talking about, have I been disappointed with roles that I didn't get, I've lost roles to people that had a higher social media profile than I, than I did. And I know that sounds like an excuse, but like, really, like I've lost hard theater roles that I believe in my heart to go to theater people, to people who've won contests. Uh, and I, you know, I'm, I want to say, I'm not putting that down. It's just that sometimes I would say, I would think exactly what you just said. It's not just about one show or even a week of shows. It's eight shows a week. And I get it. It's a business. You want the person who's out there famous on television to play. But it's unfortunate because I there were a couple of instances where I absolutely knew that I would be the better choice and that I also would be the person that will be there every performance and bring their A game because of my, of my experience. So sometimes that is frustrating because that's happened a couple of times and, and you're just like, okay, I, I can't, I can't fight this, but by the way, <laughs> you you should have picked me. <laughs> and you know, and I I there have been instances I'm I'm speaking carefully because I want to be able to get my point across without bashing something else or outing something else. So I will just say, because I don't want to get into specifics, there is a role that that I played for a, a length of time. And when they did the revival of that show somewhere else, it took three people a week to do what I was doing eight shows a week. And I was like, what to me, I'm thinking, why are you, why are you going for less experience? 
you know, it's, it's something that sometimes you just don't get. You're like, why couldn't you just get the person that could do, that could do it? Why three people, you know, they didn't start off with that. They just, people kept dropping out. You know, they couldn't, they couldn't, the one person couldn't make the whole week. So they got a second person, but then that person couldn't do that. So they had to, to juggle. And I thought, you know, one, I know eight women that can do, <laughs> can do yeah. that, you know, like. I, th I, th I think that I find that with a lot of musical theater that I go to. And, and as you say, it is a commercial business and they got to put butts in the seats. And to a certain point, I get that. But they often go for this big name that will bring in, they hope, that will bring in tickets. But yet, I know, of, as you say, I know this line of people that would be around the block that could do it eight times a week and in their sleep more yeah. so and more easily yeah. than this person. But there, we are definitely, I mean, it's kind of always been this way, but I think even more so now with social media and YouTube and just videos and personality is around us all the time, more right. so than actual talent. And so I think personality grabs our attention and gets us and excites us or makes us laugh or whatever it is. And we gravitate toward that rather than the nuanced artistic work that can go into someone's craft. Right. And, and well, I, I, I do agree with, with most of that, but I think what happens is I'm one of those people that also thinks while personality may not be enough to do eight shows a week, I do think there's a skill to that, to making these platforms work for you to be able to monetize them. So I, I don't, I don't think that they, that the person that is a uh, YouTube famous may not necessarily be able to do eight shows a week, but they might be able to successfully do television and films. I, I, I point to the Kardashians because everybody is always talking about them and claiming they don't watch them. And I'm like, how can you talk so much about somebody that you don't want? Cause I can't, I cannot talk about something like, like what I just said, where I was like, I know there was a scandal. It had something to do with somebody saying 75%. I can't speak on it. Cause I don't, I don't know it. The, the people that claim not to like the Kardashians, like know way more about them than I, I do. I'm like, you're watching something. But when people say that they're angry, I've heard this. When people say that they're angry because they're famous for nothing, I want to look and go, even if you thought that was true, can't you have respect for the empire they've created off of quote unquote nothing? Like, can't you... Can't you have respect for, it is a business. They employ so many people. There are people like you, I'm not so quick to turn down how pe uh, people, uh, the hustle that people have. It is the hustle for the technology that we have for the day that we're living in. And by the way, if I luck up on something like that, you can hate me too. Because it's about paying the rent and taking care of my child. And, you know, it's, it's, it is about working smarter, not harder. And, and so I guess because I'm older, people expect me to have a different point of view, but I don't. I look and go, you found a way to make your your dreams, which it doesn't mean I have to like them personally or but I, I'm not talking about. Personally, I'm talking. I'm literally talking about business and what they've made of their life. However, however, people there there are twenty year olds that are making so much money from TikTok, and I I get it. I get that people are like, well, they're not doing anything. I get that. However, don't be angry at them why don't you talk to the people who are buying, who want to see it or who are buying it or who, like this person finds a hustle and it's working and you're attacking them. First of all, you're, how do you know about them if you're not watching them? So what are you getting so mad about? I try to find less ways of getting upset. There's so much <laughs> stuff. Really, there's so much stuff 
that's coming at us. I'm like, that's what you're going to get upset over. You know, like people lost their minds. Uh, this is again, I always want to be respectful. The uh, uh, funny girl with the lead being replaced. Right. That I, I'm not talking about how one actress, how that must have felt. I'm not talking, I'm talking about the fervor over that situation, but not Paradise Square. And for actors, the trouble that, that they had on Broadway because of a crooked producer and the, and the awful things that that cast and company went through, to me, that's what you should be getting upset over. That's really a bigger de issue because that man never should have been allowed to produce again. I, I mean, that like, that's a big deal. Like people were really hurt. And, and, and to me, people choose what it is that they want to like get all crazy about. And then the real stuff that we should dig in and go, we, we have to make sure this doesn't happen again. It just goes over everybody's head. They gloss over that. That becomes, we'll talk about that for five minutes, but then we got to get to this other stuff. And, and the people that are discussing it the most are people who are, aren't even in show business at all. So sometimes I see the, these comments and I'm like, you don't even know what you're talking about. And then I, I'm like, stop looking. Stop looking. You're not. You're not a part of this. Stop looking. Because one time, I scrolled, and I made a comment. I was like, "This is none of your business. These people are not in show business." But I made a comment, and I said, "Why? Let me do. Let me be tactful and not confrontational." But I was. Strange Loop announced that they were closing, and everybody knows that that that's surprising when a show wins the big Tony for it to close. You know that's a big deal and people in theater know that exactly what that means and the jobs lost and what that means for actors and the technicians and how surprising it is but the people having the dialogue on online were we're not in show business we're not actors and this one person was like don't worry about them it gives them a, it gives the actors an opportunity to find new work and was all like this is a jolly thing this is a good thing and sort of talking down to this woman who said i feel so bad for the people that are going to be out of work sort of made made a comment to make them feel like you're stupid you don't know what you're talking about and so i commented to the lady and said thank you for showing empathy our industry is difficult to have a show finally get to Broadway after 18 months of a lockdown in an industry that is already unstable. And then to get there and to have a short run when most people have not worked in now two years, it's not a la la la. Let's just get, it's not actors don't see it as, Oh good. Finally get an opportunity to look for more work. <laughs> I said, yeah. So I wrote that and I said, thank you. And then the other person wrote back, I have to remind myself that because we're online, you can't see intent and I have to watch my words. And, you know, that's not what I meant and blah, blah, blah. And I said back, this is why I don't look. <laughs> I said, I love the fact that we can't see each other and that it's just words only because it forces you to choose your words wisely or not choose words at all which sometimes is the wiser choice no comment back <laughs> shut that down i was i just was like that's why i don't look because i'm i it, it is harder for me to see people have a a dialogue this person that I shut down was answering everybody's question, but this person is not in show business. So he, this person was giving out information that was wrong. Yeah. And I thought, and I'll just say this once and then I will keep quiet for life because I can't get into that. And, I, and plus I didn't want to, I wasn't trying to be confrontational. I was just saying, yeah. especially because we're online, choose your words wisely. Like that's, that's the great exercise that we have. 
with social media is that you don't have, no one's holding a gun to your head. And first of all, asking for your opinion. No one, can, no one is asking, no one is begging you, please, please impart your wisdom, <laughs> you idiot. Please impart your wisdom. No one's doing that. So if you're going to make a comment, why don't you just give it a few minutes? Just think about form it. that yeah. thought. Just think about it. Or how about this? Just think about it. And you don't have to post it at and all. Move on with your day. Move on with your day. That's what people used to do back in the old days. You <laughs> just keep stuff. We didn't have to, like, my mom used my mom said this all the time. She said, everybody's not entitled to your opinion. I'm so tired of social media gurus. I cannot tell you. We don't. None of us have this figured out life. None of us. And everybody wants to get on social media and go, hello, friends. You know what you should do today? And I'm like, turn off my cell phone because I don't want to hear you talk. <laughs> right. That's right. what I should do. We don't <laughs> have it figured out because this is actually really hard. It's really, it's difficult. And, and unfortunately, now people believe social media, what you're showing them is your best, your highlights. And so that, yeah, that's not, that's not healthy. That's not the way life is. You know, you know what I mean? It's like everybody is like, you know what you should do? What? Because if I come to over to your house when you're not looking, well, first of all, I'll be arrested because, you know, that's breaking and entering. But if you were to see people, <laughs> if you were to see people in their, in their private time, you will see nobody has it all together. That's their hustle. And you're a part of it. <laughs> it's like... I'm a life coach. You, you just, uh, you're just a person with a hustle on you. You got an account and you know, more power to you, but I'm, I'm not going to listen to you because I, first of all, I'm older than you. So, and I'm not even like wanting to give that kind of advice. Right. We certainly don't have our lives together yet. So, oh yeah. my goodness. <laughs> still learning. Still learning. We're still learning. It's like, how can you get up there and go, you know what you should do when you know you're probably like, one super life event away from a nervous breakdown yourself like that is where everybody's doing the best that they can do and that should be the only advice given do your best do the best you can do the best you can you because this is hard this is hard stuff <laughs> So for your third story, you wanted to share uh, something that we've all gone through as actors, a, a nightmare experience that you had God. on stage doing Floor of the Red Menace at Pasadena yeah. Playhouse. What, what what happened? Okay, so I was I was I was doing a soap opera at the at the time uh, for NBC. And, you know, when you're under contract, you're under contract, even if they're not using you every day you're you know you're under contract and also whatever the shooting day is that's not a guarantee of ending at any particular time that's just that's just how it is so i auditioned for flora the red menace and got it and by the way uh jody benson who is the original little mermaid voice who I did Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat with. She she and her husband, Ray, they were in the ensemble. Well, she was Flora. And um, so I was like, oh, that's, you know, that's that's great. If I get this, I'll be working with Jody again. So I got it, but they they didn't have understudies. They were not providing understudies for this production. And so my agent was like, look, we she's under contract to NBC. We cannot guarantee She'll she'll probably be finished by six or seven at, at night, but that's not a guarantee. And we're not going to pull her from the set like that. We're not getting sued over this. And they hemmed and hawed a bit, and they're like, you know, we don't. We're, this is not. We don't have it budgeted. Blah blah blah. And um, and my agent was like, well, she can't. She can't do it then, if, if, because they can't guarantee. Okay. Boom, they go off, they hire who they're going to hire, and I'm still doing my soap opera. Two days before their first performance, <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. Oh, <laughs> they call my agent and go, 
have let the young lady go for whatever reason, didn't know what the story was, just knew we let her go, wasn't working out. Please, can Sharon do this show? We will hire a, a, a lady to be the understudy. We will hire a young lady to be her understudy. Please, 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 can she? So my age, <laughs> so that's, a, you know, my my theater training tells me yes say yes because this is drama but my my but my brain like my heart my theater heart is going this is drama yes say yes and my brain is like are you insane like they like this is two days, two days. They, oh you so i said yes of course you know i said yes so so they have to get a rehearsal room to i'm i'm working i'm still like doing the the TV show. So they have to get a rehearsal room and go over everything. You know, all the all the music and I'm going I'm going over the music and in my head I'm like, wow. So did, we're we're doing this, right? And and then the next day there's a, the put in, but it's like a full-fledged rehearsal for me because we've got entrances and exits and entrances and exits and this and that. So my my scary story is that at some point all actors have had the the dream of being on stage and not knowing what show they're doing but I like I lived it because when when the curtain came up I realized in that moment I I almost wanted to fake fainting that's how scared I was I was like if I just drop like then they'll have to stop the show. <laughs> they'll have to wait. Hold on one second. I'm getting my I'm getting my plug. I thought. Wait. Wait. Can you okay. hear me? Yeah. 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 Wait. Can you hear me? Oh, Go so I can it. keep talking. Okay. I, I get. What the, what so the, I, what the, no. Find I, your plug. Find your plug, and then come back. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I was like, I'm like, can you hear me? Can you hear? Me? Yeah. I got. I'm sorry. I saw. I just saw like this little. Oh yeah. Little yeah. Yeah. We don't want up. your computer going out. I know, because that, that is not, I can't believe my cat has been quiet all this time. Probably shouldn't say that because that will ruin it. All right. Are we good? We're good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank We're you. Back. Thank yeah, you for back. that. We're... Sorry about that. I, I actually thought I was plugged in. I didn't realize. So it, So every time I had to make a, an, an entrance, you know, there was somebody on the side and with a script and everything. I, I didn't, I couldn't have the show committed to memory, but I literally didn't know the show, Patrick. I'm talking about literally like I was, the curtain was up and I went, I I don't know anything. I don't know anything. I don't know time, space. I don't know what the show is about. I was like, I don't know. It was very terrifying. And I was like in the group numbers, I was just a little bit behind with the lyrics. I would like, you know, like sing, sing just a little bit. You know how somebody goes, if somebody's singing, I don't know, over the rainbow and you're like, like start singing over the rainbow. This is start, just start singing over the rainbow. And I'll tell you what I was like. Somewhere, Somewhere over the over rainbow. The rainbow. Yeah, like that, where I'm, where I'm a little bit behind you because I'm like, oh yeah, that's it. It was so it was it was terrifying because it was like that for the for the first week. You know, there was no time to go to get to get comfortable. It was just fear. Yeah. It was fear all the time. And, and and I was aware of the fact I'm doing a show and I don't know what I'm doing. I'm living the nightmare instead of living the dream. I'm living the nightmare. And that like I, it, it was, it was lots of little things where I would make an entrance and we'd be in the middle of a, of a group number and I didn't know one thing about it. And I was like, oh my God, I'm standing here and I don't even know when to leave. This is so horrible. Like the main scenes that I had, I got through, but all the rest of the stuff was just a, a it was a nightmare for me. It was a nightmare. It's like the only other thing that could happen now is that my all my clothes fall off. Like just poof. You know right. what I mean? <laughs> While I'm on stage, just suddenly I'm like, why am I naked? But it was it was really 
it was really hideous. And the other, the other thing that wasn't, that was scary, but there was another moment where I actually scared my mom. Um, I, you know, I, I have like a million stories because I grew up in this industry. So I, somebody said this to me the other day and went, every time there's some major thing that happens, you know, these people. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I was like, I didn't realize how many people is just a part of my upbringing and, and how, I mean, I always thought it was so cool, but like superstars that were just like over at our house, you know, like Miles well, well, Davis. Well, before we get to the story, Tyson. well, before we get to the story, I want to find out though, did it ever not become a nightmare? Did you ever start to feel Flora the Menace, the show and get into it? The last week. <laughs> yeah, the there you go. The last week. No, seriously, the last week. I always felt because it was a short run anyway. It wasn't a, a super long run. And, you know, I, I don't know if, you, if this is true for you. I always feel like the three month mark is the sweet spot for, okay, we're here. And now we go to another level. Another, like, I feel, I feel it like the three months, the first three months is, is when you are letting it gel and finding things and you, but you need three months before, or at least I do before it feels like, okay, I know, I, I know what I'm doing. It's three, it's that, it's that third month that you're like, now I can go to the next level. I keep wanting to dig deeper and get better and, and you know, do more and more. And I don't think, I don't think the run was that long. So really, I, I never felt I never really felt it. And the, the like th things started to gel in the final week. I was like, oh, yes, this makes sense that I enter here and the, I get. And then we were we were it was done because it was it wasn't that long. It was it was an uncomfortable gig where I loved who I was working with. I loved the, the, the people. But my own life on stage was always really scary. Oh, no, no, no. It, it, it sounds like a horrible place to be. In. It was a terrible, it was terrible. It was, it was terrible because it, it, it felt like that nightmare all the time. Mm. It felt like I was always coming in going, what show is this? What well, show is the only other? But I, I was just about to say, um, it's it's interesting when you talk about regional theaters that don't really have a lot of you know you that three month window you, you don't you don't get that in regional theaters no. I mean you you may get two maybe four if you're lucky weeks of rehearsal and then a month or two of run and then you're done yeah. so you often don't get that but I I think that's one thing that I love about regional theater it just kind of like throws it up and it's it's a different muscle than say when oh. you're on a long run tour or a Broadway show yeah. like you've done the, because I because like for me I know that I was cast in one of my dream roles Don Quixote and Man of La Mancha yeah. but I did it for 400 bucks a week less than 400 sorry less than 400 I mean getting paid nothing but it was like but I get to do this role and, yeah. you know, we had two or three weeks of rehearsal and then got to do it for a month. And, and it was like, I may never get to do this again. So, right. it, I mean, that, that, that's one thing that I love about kind of doing the regional circuit, you know, kind of yeah. away from the, the eyes and the high profile of like New York. I don't like the pay. Yeah. I don't like the pay. I, this is just going to make so many of my, my friends mad because it's so polarizing my opinions on this but i remember when lord was started god that makes me sound like a, a stone but and, and like a rock but um i remember hearing about that and you know being i mean i was much younger but very cock cockily is that a word oh i was very cocky when i said that will never work i remember saying that to my friends, I was like, no actor is going to fall for this contract. That will never work. Because I thought it's, how can you like take care of yourself on that little money and you're, you're not going to do less because that's not what you do as an actor. You don't, you don't put in based on what you're getting paid or else yeah. <laughs> our industry would suck. Right. I've never I, given a performance that was based upon my pay ever. I 
I mean, can you imagine, <laughs> can you imagine like, <laughs> you know, so I, so I, to this day, I'm, I'm like, I'm, mm. I'm not in love. I'm not in love with that aspect of it. I'm not in love with it because and, it, and the and the older you get, the more bills you have, and so you're like you're still paying me like I'm 18. Well, don't, well, yeah, because I mean, uh, as you say, a lot of performers, and I've been there. A lot of performers will sacrifice personally, financially, just to do theater, just to do this particular show, and of course, as we've been talking about, we artists love what we do. We, we, we do it because we love it. We're passionate about it. But how have you found that balance with making a living, the business side, getting paid, but then also being an artist and doing what you love? Oh, I don't know that I've found the balance. I mean, I don't think I've so found do, the balance. Then do you just because have to choose think, one or the other? Well, because I... I don't do this at home kids okay don't follow my lead but I will always choose to starve <laughs> <laughs> rather than not get paid my worth because that's a that's just a, a pit that you fall in that you don't get it or or to do something that I know oh, this is not I am not gonna have a good time doing this like I am I am the person who will leave a bad situation without necessarily having a situation to go to in life and in my career that's just so I don't know that I found the balance. I know that a lot of people would look at me and go, you're, you're a fool, but it's okay because they don't have to worry about it. You know, it's, it's, it's me, but I mean, I, I don't know that I, I don't know that I found that balance. I just know that there are certain things that I will do and certain things that I, that I won't do. I, I was doing my taxes this is, this is I'll, I'll make this short. Uh, but but during my divorce, when hey, I'm I'm sorry, people. Hey, Roar, get down. I'm sorry, people. <laughs> podcast. I have a cat. Get down. You know you can't. You have to get. Okay. <laughs> this is unbelievable. If you could. I I, I never saw her. No. So. <laughs> it's just. She's get, he is getting ready to knock down my lights. Oh my goodness! No, 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 no. You <laughs> do you see the size of this cat? Right. I have a mountain lion. Okay, you must be here. Sorry. Um, I'm so right, sorry. Right, where right, were we? Right, I'm so right. sorry. So you were doing your taxes around your divorce. Yeah. So so when I was married, you know, we had joint taxes and then and then when i was divorced i was doing my my taxes and you know it had been a while since i did them uh by myself you know i mean i mean as a as a single person right so i kept looking each year going is this all i made because i was working all the time and i was like my taxes changed changed how i changed what i say yes to i was i i i looked and went i've been working for peanuts and you putting out all the same energy as if you were paying me you know a million bucks and my taxes revealed that to me that i was saying yes more times than i should and that I wasn't getting paid my worth. I was like, I have worked so hard all year, and this is it. This is because I this is because I did this for free, and did this for little, and did this for that, you know. And this was this favor. And the second year and the third year were different because I learned how to say no. And I was like, because you have to create 
you kind of have to set your own precedent and go, if, if I'm going to say yes to these things, it gets you in a hole and you're, you're the sacrifice that you have to make is I'm going to struggle here, but people are going to either learn to hire me at, and, and for what, I, what I'm worth as a, as a performer, or they'll get somebody else, but I don't want to work for under this amount. I don't want to do it. Mm. And that is not an easy decision to make. And it's definitely not easy when you're not 18. Do you know what I mean? That's not, it's yeah. just not, but I just looked, it was so revealing to me. And that, and that's the thing is, you know, it's not just a business for us. I mean, for for the for the producers and the then the directors and the incredible technicians and it, it's not just a business for the investors. It's also a business for actors. And I think what happens now. I think what happens. I know what happens. We're always told and reminded, as if we had to be reminded, how much we love this business and what we're willing to do to play a role. I mean, you just said it to play a role, but I could never do a reading and get the great Tom Kidd, I'm only mentioning him because I worked with him and I love him so much, and and go, can you do this this reading, can you do the music for my reading for $300? It's just, a tw it's just 29 hours. <laughs> Tom Kidd? Do you know what I'm saying? But you can be hired as an actor to do a show where Tom Kitt is, is doing the music and they ask you to work for $300 or $500. Because it's just 29 hours. And, and, we're, and I'm like, how come it's a business for you guys, but it's not a business for us? Mm. We have bills to pay. We have, I, I, but this is a polarizing the thing I'm saying, because not, not all actors agree with me, but you know, I've, I know a lot of people. So I've been to a lot of homes, you know, when you're just socializing and none of my actor friends have apartments like the directors I know or the producers I know that none of them live that way. That's a good point. Yes. Even, even the agents that have, Oh, this is, this is the, the we, we go to the Hamptons and we I'm not saying that actors don't live this way. What happens is the actors that are working and that have the awards and that they, that are famous, that are, you know, celebrity status, that keep on getting the roles on Broadway because it's a business and you got to have the people pulling them in. That's all anybody focuses on. But when you're not that, what you are aware of is there are more actors that are not living that life. And so when you tell somebody your time is valuable, but actors, there are so many of you and everybody wants to do what you're doing. And so in order to get this big production on, we got to skimp somewhere. There's so many of you in the, in the do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I could never go to Michael Mayer. That's that's another director. Like I'm I'm pointing these people out because I worked with them and because I I love yep. them. And go, can you direct my my reading? And hi he's got a price. He'll he'll do the reading, but he's got his quote is way higher than ours. Right. And if you want, and and so that's what when I when I realize. Well, I guess I'm like, I'm skipping ahead to actually, I'm realizing I'm kind of crossing over into a question you were going to ask later on, which is, <laughs> who is the most invaluable, do you think? Right, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Who is yeah, the I'll most under, yeah. undervalued? <laughs> 